Hi, I'm Jared Brown. I'm Anastasia Miller. We're here to talk about gin. That's something you always hear about is lately is gin and the origin of gin. But we're going to change your mind about that. Um, it's time to debunk everything that you've heard about the history of gin. Yes. Uh, we're going to start very simple. There was, there was a man who wrote for the Gin and Vodka Association in 1994. Gin is one of those subjects that attracts myth. And like myth, stories about gin are repetitive. When you read the literature, you'll find the ideas go round and round. And that is so much the truth, even though we're in 2021, it is so much the truth, but we're here to change that. Um, we're changing it because of a group of people from London, the Worshipful Company of Distillers of London, which was chartered in 18, 1638. 1638. Um, luckily, two gentlemen, the King's personal physician and the Queen's personal physician uh, were the founders of a livery of distillers, um, Theodore de May, Turquet de Mayen and Thomas Cademan. De Mayen's also famous for one other thing. He was responsible for bringing public health, the idea of public health to London at the height of the century long plagues that plagued London. Didn't he also found another guild? Yes, the Worshipful Company of uh, Worshipful Company of Apothecaries, which had been taken away from the Worshipful Company of Grocers. This gets very complicated after a while. But what they did was they created a book of guidelines, standard guidelines. Uh, this is how you're going to make all of the spirits that you're allowed to make if you're a member of the Worshipful Company. And this book was called The Distiller of London, published the year after the Guild was founded, so in 1639. When you read the foreword of this book, the front matter reads like something that would have been written a century or a century and a half later, talking about the desperate need to improve distilling practices. This was what the Guild was formed to do, and it's also what this book was written to do. But the book was only written for the initiate. It was only written for guild members. And you so had to take an oath to have this book. And it was given to you written in code. So here you can see the coding of the book. Why don't you talk about the coding? Because Anastasia about <laughs> took about a year to decipher this code. Though the book was published in 1639, in 1667, Another publisher published a deciphered version of it, but as Anastasia discovered, it's incorrect. <laughs> understatement. Yeah, it was incorrect. Yes. A lot of the measurements were incorrect. Uh, a lot of the assumptions of what was there was incorrect. What you're looking at right now is the cipher for these books. The, they, these were all privately printed, but the one thing they did not print in the actual book was the decode, the, the actual coding. Um, so you'll see both left and right hand side, two different versions of handwritten interpretations of the code. And then even the measurements down on the bottom, the numbers one through zero appear as letters. Uh, this, is, this is one of the things that took a while to figure out is what, what were they actually talking about? Um, it's interesting they even used astrological symbols. Well, that, was, um, that made sense because they were alchemists. Distillers were considered to be alchemists and they were part of the medical community and the medical community were also alchemists and they used astrological symbols for a lot of things. Oh, you've just jumped to a very interesting recipe in this book, aqua fructum, water of fruits. If you take a look at this recipe with strong proof spirit, juniper berries, quince and pippin pairings, so essentially apple peels, and then lemon and orange peels. Okay, we've now got juniper and orange and lemon, and then spices, nutmeg, anise, cloves. This is starting and to then sound familiar. These are distilled together. So here, for the first time in history, you see gin taking shape with juniper, citrus, spice supported. It's practically a modern gin formula. Um, but what we're talking about is, is, is gin, not just gin. In, 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 in truth, we're talking about a word that gets bandied around for 400 years all over the place. Well, and means a bunch of different things. But we're talking about London dry gin. 
we've talked with Desmond Payne about this from, from Beef Eater, and he and I both agree, it was very difficult to find a recipe that actually combined something other than juniper with juniper that made a spirit that could be comparable, comparable to what we now know as London Dry Gin. And this recipe is about the closest. Now, this recipe, of course, used the strong proof spirit of the day and not malt spirit because? Well, there were two reasons. Well, they were using malt spirit to a point, but the problem was, was that a lot of it was being made with stale beer and that was against the law. And it was also- From the malt spirit. Yeah. Also, wasn't there a higher tax on the malt spirit? There was a much higher tax on, tax on malt spirits. And that was the other part of the problem is they, they eventually came down to, not at this point, but just a little bit later, they came down to the point where most distillers said, we're not even going to bother with malt spirit anymore. We're so, just going to use straight neutral spirits. So here we're at say strong proof spirit. We presume that to be grain spirit rather than malt. Yeah. Uh, but the grain spirit at the time would have been distilled up to no more than about 68%, which is about as far as you could push it on the pot stills at the time. So this was essentially a new make whiskey. And so the formula would have had to balance for that, which is why just after distillation and after the rectification with the um, botanicals, you see to the spirit add strawberries and raspberries bruised. Pink gin. And yes, <laughs> pink, gin. pink gin is maybe a trend that's even passing right now, but 1639, Here's a pink gin recipe, because <laughs> when you add this fruit after distillation and let it macerate in, the strawberries, strawberry, the color tends to oxidize and it'll go rust very quickly. But raspberries, um, we've made a raspberry infused gin and the color has held for up to six years. So that would have been a pink gin. Also dulcified, sweetened, all of this to balance against that rough base spirit but it also shows that this was not being made for medical reasons. But here in 1639, we see a beverage alcohol being produced, clearly for pleasure. This is, this is where it becomes interesting because again, there's always been the assumption that this was all medicinal and that everything was medicinal, but you have to go back another few years to 1602 to women's household kitchen advice manuals. Because 1639 was not the end of our journey it's, of research. It really was the beginning. And now we're going to keep diving back. Okay, so the first person we go visit is Sir Hugh Platt. He was the son of London's largest brewer. Uh, and, and he also was really good about, you know, how do you do better with, with uh, keeping beer, and making reviving stale beer at home, all sorts of fun things. How to make perfumes, I mean, delights for ladies. He was into making lavender water and who knows what else under the sun. There's one recipe though that's really key. 1602, spirit of spices. Again, distilling juniper with other ingredients. So we're taking, we're taking gin away from the commercial producers and bringing it home where it really, it really, was a delight. It was not meant to be a medicine. Spirit of Spices was just as it was. It was Spirit of Spices, something you served the gentleman who came home with your husband, and this is what you would have. The instructions on this recipe distill with gentle heat, either in balneo or ashes. What that meant was a bain-marie. So set this still over water bath or using ashes, meaning setting the still into coals that have burned down. So both were very gentle forms of heat because yeah. you didn't want to scorch the botanicals inside the still or scorch the spirit. Certainly you didn't want to bring the spirit temperature up too high, too fast. Now let's go back a little bit further to Peter Morwin, who translated a book by Swiss bot bot botanist, uh, Conrad Gessner. And again, we're talking about, oh, I have to actually use these for this. Talking again about putting juniper with cloves, cinnamon, mace, galligal. It, the, the list goes on and on. Uh, 
and we're, we're again going backwards again to Switzerland this time. So keep going. Now, the one point where we do see Dutch coming in and saying, yes, there is juniper spirit, but this is, this is the trick. Philip Bermani's book does not mention any other botanicals being put into this juniper spirit except juniper. So 1550s, still not what we're talking about with, with gin being real gin, being gin, the complex creature gin. It's just juniper water. But where did he get it from? And where did the English even get the idea from? We can thank Lawrence Andrew, 1527, who translated a book. Um, and he took, it, he took it word for word of, of how to make a juniper water. By but water. it was put by water, meaning strong water, aqua ardens at the time. Alcohol. Alcohol. But again, 1527, this book is in England, printed in London talking about making juniper water. You know that the apothecaries were looking at this and going, oh, wonderful, now we know how to was do this. Was there a book in Holland that said that at the time? Yes, there was, but that's where it gets tricky, is Lawrence Andrew translated his version in 1527 of this book, 1500 Germany. Hieronymus Brunschweig wrote the ultimate book on the subject at the time of how to distill spirits. And he told people how to make Beckenwalder Wasser, juniper berry water. Now this book was the most popular thing of all times. It was translated into French, Spanish, Italian, uh, Dutch, and finally, Lawrence Andrew, English. Uh, the, Dutch, the Dutch got this book in 1513. Is it true that this was running second to the Bible? It was second to the Bible. Yeah. It was second to the Bible. You figure Johannes Gutenberg came up with his printing press and developed it enough where he was able, able to mass produce them in 1450. We're talking just a few years later. Oh, 50 years later. 50 and years later. This, this, is, this is one of the hottest titles going. But we also discovered there was a book before then that came out of Germany. You keep, I'm going to keep saying this, Germany. And that book was by Michael Puff von Schrick. Uh, the, the whole thing is too long to say, but von Allen Gebreten Wassern uh, was the first in 1476, just after Gutenberg, to come up with a juniper water. Uh, it, does, it doesn't look like it says it there, but it does. Uh, Walter, Walter Pair. Uh, again, just a simple juniper water. Once but, again, a strong water, uh, not water, yeah. but alcohol. Yeah, but again, coming from coming out of Germany, the, the influence was German. The thing that's fascinating that, uh, that actually supports this idea is that there were more problems with the gin craze, if you want to call it that, the gin craze in Augsburg, Germany in the late 1400s and early 1500s before 1513, uh, where they were trying to convince women not to make this crude juniper water using grain spirit, but they should support the honorable distillers who were making juniper water with brandy. So think about this. This, this, whole, this whole notion of gin spirit actually came from Germany and even the craze of drinking it came from Germany almost 200 years before we re can really start discussing anything coming out of Holland or out of Skidam. So it, it, it's a different way to look at, at how, how a spirit actually makes it through. Here's the timeline of it. And you can see where, where we have talked for years about in, including us, we talked for years about it came over in 1688 with William and Mary, and that it had been, it'd been invented by Dr. Sylvius, uh, Francis de la Beau, or Franciscus de la Beauve, whomever you want to think about, uh, somewhere in, in Skidam or in Amsterdam in the 1600s. But look at how many years beforehand this came along. Um, it really is an eye opener to us that this one little book and this one little recipe shows us a new way to look at where London dry gin came from 
before the continuous still made it officially into London dry gin in the 1830s. So here we have a recipe from 1639 with juniper, with orange and lemon peel, spice supported. Now think about this. If gin evolved from Geneva, and Geneva was first discovered by British troops in Holland during the Thirty Years' War, seeing the soldiers there drinking Dutch courage, and then was really launched into the culture by William and Mary, 1689. 1640s to 1680s. Sparking, <laughs> the, sparking the gin craze, and then gin evolved from that later. Hang on. If the evolution of gin is the addition of citrus and spices, that recipe is clearly already in the culture. So truly what we had was the birth of English gin in London prior to Geneva arriving and becoming an overwhelming trend. And even where there's one other, one other bit of proof, which comes from William Pulteney making a speech before Parliament in the 1600s, saying that we have had gin for over a century. Think about When it. did he make this speech? Uh, sometime around 1698, 1700. And saying we have had gin for, for over, over a, a century. century. And this is what actually got me thinking, maybe there's something. Now, he didn't this. use the word gin in that. Yes, he did. He did. Yes. In what year? 1690 something, 1700. I mean, that puts the history of the word gin back from the earliest known use in 1714. Yes, it does. But there you go. And so <laughs> clearly, Geneva was hugely popular. And the gin craze was around Geneva. But when gin emerged and the tail end of the gin craze, it wasn't a new thing. It was a return to the traditional English spirit. Now, there's one last question we will answer because I know there's a few of you out there who are going to ask it, is where does this idea of Dr. Silvius come from? So far that we've managed to trace, you can trace it back to about 1814 to a gentleman by, oh no, 17, 1713. 1713, when a gentleman by the name of Dr. Peter Shaw wrote an essay of distillation on, and you can only find this in some other smatterings in the 1800s. It says essay on distilling, which it isn't. It's one of three essays in a book that was, was published in 17. A century, a century after it was written. So 1814, it was mentioned in an encyclopedia, yeah. but in that encyclopedia, the writer injected the name Dr. Silvius, as well as talking about Shaw's essay on distilling. And then um, Defoe picked it up, or not Defoe, someone yeah, who so annotated, annotated Robinson Crusoe, Crusoe yeah. the next year, yeah. picked it up and it appeared in the annotated Robinson Crusoe. And so everyone picks it up, 1844, it gets picked up again in a home economies dictionary. It, it, in other words, it's one of those myths that kept on rolling from the 1700s, at right, right in the midst of the gin craze but had very little to do and never said any of what we've just told you. They never bothered to say that there was something already there. Because they'd missed that wonderful book from the Worshipful Company of Distillers, The Distiller of London. Well, nobody would have found it, they weren't a member. <laughs> but we've actually taken Anastasia's decoding of the book and we've included a foreword of our discoveries on the origins of gin, and we have republished this book, The Distiller of London, and with proceeds going to the industry charity of the Worshipful Company of Distillers. So if you want to, if you want to learn more about what this, what this really means in terms of being a gin distiller, have a look at this book and look at all of the recipes, plus the alternate versions of these recipes that's also in here. So you're looking at over 60 some odd recipes uh, and see how the development could have happened. And it's also gonna help you think about how you could develop something yourself that would be unique on the subject. But there you go. Thank you. Wanna know more? Email us. We're always available. <laughs>